Good morning. morning. It's good to see all of you here on this almost spring morning. Um, I I, I keep hoping that it'll warm up, but uh, maybe soon. Um, I do want to announce, um, we'll have more information coming up, but we will be having Monday Thursday service and um, Easter Sunday, we will be having breakfast at 9.30, followed by breakfast at 9, followed by service at, at 10.30. So please um, keep that in mind. And um, we do have one more fish fry. So Lori, anything that we need to share about that? Yeah. <laughs> Once again, here we go. I'm going to do some flyers and my help list again. We are doing the prep work Thursday evening, 6 o'clock, <clears throat> instead of doing Thursday morning because of my work schedule. Um, let me see. I need some help. Friday morning, I think we're good. Actually, I need somebody to chop up onions for me. Nancy said she's <laughs> yep. For this year, they say they're going to reinvent it for next year. Um, no, it's not necessarily going to four days. Well, they said suggested. It's been suggested four days. There's other ones that still want it to eight days. So they're discussing it. Um, meetings are the second Wednesday of the month. At 7 o'clock at Sweeney Hose. So if anybody really wants to make their opinion known, show up at the meeting. That's all I can tell you. Um, it, it, they're planning on reinventing it and um, getting some things done this year. Some things slid through the cracks that weren't supposed to slide through the cracks. And so it's just making it impossible time frame to get things done for the uh, the decision was made amongst the whole group that it gets postponed till next year for the 40th canal fest and, and let's reinvent it and find out what we need to do to draw people in, to get families there, to get the community there, and so on, and hopefully make it bigger and better. So that's the deal. But here's the list. Excellent. So, um, yes. Fish fries. And then um, as, as Chris, the festival outside here comes up, I'll fill you guys in a little more. 
Excellent. Well, thank you for all your organizing work. And um, are there any other announcements? Then let us join together in our call to worship. Kindred of God, a new vision of leadership is called forth and God calls upon the least likely, the unheard of, and the humble of heart to assemble to receive anointing. Though the call may involve risk and danger, we are called to listen, obey, and live a love unwavering. God's call does not depend on our outward appearance or our earthly achievements. Let us open our hearts to God this day. Amen. Let us pray. Anointed one, your love comes peaceably into our lives if we will but let it. We are so fixated on the gold standard the familiar, and the safe choice that we often lose sight of what you are raising up right in our very midst. Enliven us with your spirit this day so that we might get a glimpse of your peace. Take what we might imagine as too small for your kingdom and use it to open the world to your overflowing abundance and provision for all that you have created. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Our first hymn is number seven, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. You may stand if you wish.
Let us join together in prayer. Loving God, as the, season change, as the seasons change, as things warm up, we celebrate the signs of life in the flowers that are starting to poke through the earth. And we remember that you provide us opportunities for healing and new life. Lord, we thank you for all the ways you provide. We pray especially today for those who are sick. Pray that you would be with them and comfort them and bring physical and spiritual healing. We pray that you would be with their loved ones as well and with the doctors and nurses who care for them. Lord, we thank you for opportunities to serve. We thank you for all who participated last week in the bowling fundraiser, and we pray that you would help us always to look for ways that we can recognize the needs of others around us and that we can serve and welcome them into our community. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our offering plates are by the door. Let us take a moment to sing the doxology and bless our offerings. Generous God, you remind us that you anoint our heads with oil and that our cup overflows with your abundance. We do not take for granted all that you provide. Take these gifts and use them for the healing and tender care of your hurting world. May your cup of love overflow and abide with the hurting and heartbroken, forgotten and despised, so that we may all be made whole. Amen. And I forgot to mention, um, in your bulletins there are envelopes for the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. This is a wonderful program that allows churches of many denominations to work together to serve money, or to collect money to, to serve and assist around the world. So particularly when there have been natural disasters or other problems, uh, one Great Hour of Sharing provides us funds that can be sent and sent quickly to provide assistance. So if, if, you, if you wish, you can uh, use the, the envelope and leave it in the bowl, bowl on your way out. Our first reading today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance, or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected I have rejected him, for the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. 
Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came, up, came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Our second reading is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. And our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 9. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It, is, it was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight, and so they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. For the second time they called the man who had been born blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. 
Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment, so that those who do not see, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. This is the word of the Lord. Some weeks I struggle to find something to say about the lectionary passages. And then other weeks there are so many things that we could talk about. How how much time do we have? I'm not going to keep you for too long. I know one clergy friend who's been struggling with a lot lately shared in a clergy group that they weren't sure what they would talk about. They felt like, like they'd run out of ideas. They were so tired and run down that they weren't sure how to preach today. So they said they were going to share some of their struggles, read through Psalm 23, and talk about trusting in God. My response was that even though we call pastors shepherds, sometimes even the shepherds also need to rest by God's still waters. I shared last month about the grief over my clergy colleague who died by suicide. This colleague who said that she wasn't sure how to preach today is part of that group. She was very close to him and his family. And many of us have come together over the last weeks to share and to try to support each other. And we've even gotten to spend some time on Zoom with his widow, who was shocked that Facebook has apparently figured out that she's widowed and has already started sending notices about online dating groups. Um, She was not, not ready for that. Many people these days are struggling. Even though we're back to so many so-called normal activities after the start of the pandemic three years ago, there is still a lot of stress. And in particular, people in caring professions, clergy, therapists, teachers, healthcare and emergency workers, they're struggling. Because sometimes they know that because of their work, they're supposed to be They're supposed to be having it all together. They're supposed to be helping other people. And yet at the end of the day, many of them aren't sure how to keep going on for themselves. Self-care is really important. And as I think I've shared before, I've heard people say, you know, when you're on the airplane and they talk about those air masks that come down, they say, if you have someone traveling with you, put on your own mask first before you try to help them. And yet too often we put ourselves last and have nothing left for ourselves, but if that goes on too long, we have nothing left for others. I mentioned recently that instead of thinking about Lent just as a time of sacrifice, thinking as one friend described it, of spending this time of Lent sitting in God's lap is a challenging idea, a challenging idea to remind us to take care of ourselves, to turn to God for help. And our psalm today continues that. I also like the story from Samuel. I always have to kind of laugh when I read that because I I can see And I can appreciate Samuel's expectations as he sees David's various sons. Sees the first son, he's tall, he's handsome. This must be a good leader, right? 
And as he goes down the line of all seven sons, each one of them, straight out of central casting as the kind of person you would pick as a leader. But God says, nope, none of them. So finally, when when none of those sons is the choice, and God has already told Samuel that one of David's sons is going to be the next king, he says, well, is there anyone else? And they say, well, yeah, there's, there's little David, but he's, he's off with the sheep. You, you, you can't mean him. And, and even though it doesn't specifically say this, I, I like to think of one of the brothers just sort of grudgingly saying, okay, I'll go get him, dragging David back. And if he's been out in the fields with the sheep, let's be clear, he's probably a little bit smelly. Standing there, not sure what's going on, and Samuel anoints him, chooses him to be the next king. How many times do we judge people on superficial things and not on the most important things? Because of this story of choosing David, And the fact that David was a shepherd, our readings today included Psalm 23, possibly one of the most popular chapters in the Bible, one that is certainly read at many funerals. A reminder that we are like the sheep. That as a shepherd cares for the sheep, God cares for us. Now maybe Green pastures and still waters themselves may not seem like the most important things for us, but the idea that God provides for us, that God is caring for us and giving us the things we need, and that God is seeking to restore us, to lead us in the right paths. But one of the things that I find so powerful about this psalm is it's not just about the good times. It's not just about the good moments because it says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Now, maybe in our own time, if someone came and poured a cup of oil over your head, you might not be so happy about that. But in the ancient world, that was a sign of honor, a sign of being marked for something special. And the psalm ends with such a powerful statement of hope and confidence. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Even in the midst of challenges, in the midst of fear, in the midst of struggles, this is such a powerful statement of hope. And then we come to the gospel reading. And it was a long reading, so I'm not going to walk through every single verse there. But there are so many ways that we could go down other, probably problematic issues. That chapter, the Gospel of John as a whole, in fact, was written in a time when the Jewish community and the Christian community had started to pull farther apart initially because, of course, Jesus was Jewish, his followers were Jewish. And from what we read in some of the books of the New Testament, it seems that the early Christians still considered themselves Jews. They still went to the temple and they prayed and they kept the Jewish laws. But as time went on, they moved farther and farther apart. And so the Gospel of John says many negative things about the Jews and paints them as the enemies. Now, some of the things may be true or may may have elements of truth. But just as when people are fighting, or even when our children are fighting, the things they say and the things they tell other people about the person they're fighting with may have an element of truth, but of course are biased towards the person who's who's speaking them. And so 
this chapter in John presents this idea of the man who was born blind and came to see through Jesus' ministry, through his healing, as someone who comes to see and follow God versus those who think they can see and aren't. Spiritual blindness has been a common way that people have read this, pointing specifically at the Jewish people as the blind ones. But right from the beginning of that chapter, it gets into what I think is potentially problematic territory, because it starts from the idea that that man was born blind as punishment for someone's sin. And Jesus' response, instead of saying, well, no, blindness happens, it's not even a result of sin, his answer still is uncomfortable for me because it says, well, no, he was born blind so that now I could heal him and demonstrate God's power. So that man had struggled, had been unable to work, had had to require assistance to get around, in fact, had to beg for sustenance, all so that God could then at some point in, in the man's life bring healing, that, that seems very uncomfortable to me. The imagery of saying we were blind, we couldn't see, and now we can, is a powerful idea. But I know that many people who are blind or have other disabilities and when they hear about these things in the Bible that talk about healing, talking about giving sight to the blind, have shared that this sometimes creates problems, creates problems in the ways that people look at people with disabilities. I few years ago when this, when this chapter came up, I shared a little bit about my classmate in, in graduate school who is legally blind. He, he can see a little bit, and so if, if he held the book right up to here, and of course he ha- has those you know really thick glasses, um, he went on, he, he had been a Lutheran pastor. He went on to get a doctorate and eventually became dean of the Lutheran Seminary in Chicago and is now, in fact, bishop in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in um, Upper Upper Michigan. But he told stories of how, at various points, people made mistaken assumptions about him because he was blind. Um, maybe you know people who are blind and people will talk very loudly to them, you know, somehow on the assumption that not only are they blind, but they're also deaf, or that their blindness means they are not intelligent. This friend of mine, at several points when he was interviewing for various positions, people would say, well, how can you be a minister if you're blind? What does that have anything to do with it? How can you be a professor? As I say, he um, got his doctorate. His his dissertation took a lot of research and a lot of reading, and sometimes using various other tools, audio readers and things like that. But this is is certainly not an unintelligent person. And yet, when people were interviewing him, they couldn't, pardon the expression, they couldn't see past his blindness. And so, when people with disabilities come into the church and they hear things like this, and they hear people use this language of needing to be healed, yes, I, I've heard many say, you know, if, if they could wave a wand and get rid of the disability, some of them might take that opportunity. But They are who they are. And when sometimes Christians have come to them, well, let us pray over you. And of course, when the disability does not disappear, 
then it feels like a failure. Or it feels like people are starting from the assumption that there's something wrong with them. Many of them have come to distrust religious folks. They've also come to distrust the fact that they do not always feel included. It's a very good thing that we have our our elevator here, but there are still many churches where there are not elevators or chairlifts. There was a uh, facility that was often used up at Silver Bay for um, the UCC state annual conferences. And the main hall of the church was on an upper level and there was no elevator, no stairlift or anything like that. So people in wheelchairs were told, well, you can sit down here and we'll, we'll, we'll set up speakers so that you can hear what's going on. Imagine how welcoming that feels. And in fact, at one year at the state conference, there was a proposal to say that any UCC events needed to be held at places that were accessible. I thought this was a really obvious solution, an obvious policy, and yet there was a lot of debate. How welcome do you think people feel when they hear things like that? Without even thinking about it and and about the connections to all of this, I had picked Amazing Grace as our second hymn which of course has the line, I was blind, but now I see, which is actually also a quote from the gospel reading. But again, for some blind people, that creates problems, that creates discomfort. So my friend who is now bishop posted on Facebook a sermon by another pastor who was born blind, And also shared about the fact that he had a hard time getting a job at first because, again, people couldn't somehow understand that even though he was blind, he could still be a pastor. I also remember a man in our Niagara Falls church who, I forget the exact causes, but I think it was something about when he... When he was born, he was premature, and something in terms of the medications and the oxygen that they, they used when he was born, his, his eyes never fully developed, and so he was blind from birth. And he somehow found out about our church in Niagara Falls, and so started attending, and people would always make sure there was somebody to pick him up. And at one point, my dad was getting rid of files from his filing cabinet files from premarital counseling and other kinds of things. And so he said, Bill, I've got the perfect job for you because there are some of these things that are confidential. And, you know, nobody else needs to be able to see the notes that I took when I was getting these people ready, helping these people get ready to get married. You're the perfect one for the job. You can help take these things out of the binder and put them in the box to be shredded because you can't see them. And he got such a kick out of the fact that, that he could do that. But again, part of the, I, the idea I want to focus on is how do, we, how do we think of people with disabilities? Do we see them as being defined by that disability? Or do we see that as just part of them and not the defining part? It's been kind of interesting the last few weeks to have to be carrying this thing around because, of course, some people, what happened to you? What did you do? And, well, you know, I have to then explain that I'm paying the consequences of some bad decisions, but also having to pay attention to the fact that getting in and out of some of the buildings on campus isn't necessarily easy. It is accessible. There is a way to get all the way through the campus, But sometimes that means having to really go far around because of where the ramps and the elevators are. Whereas if I didn't have to use this or worry about steps, I could make a much more direct path. I remember one time I was looking for a site for a conference and wanting to be 
aware of the access issues, they said, well, the main dining room where, where we would have your, have your program is in, in the basement. This was a building that had once been the mansion of a very wealthy person from Cleveland. It's a beautiful conference center, but the main dining room is in the basement and very narrow, windy stairs to get to it. There was an elevator, but you would have to sort of go to the other end of the building, take the elevator to the pool room, um, wind around the edge of the pool, through the kitchen, and finally into the dining room. And I said, you know, I, I, this is a great facility, but this is obviously not going to work for us. Um, but again, how, 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 do we, how do we think about how we treat people who are, who are different? So what do we do with all of this? It's easy to fall into the common pattern that people use with this verse. God made him blind in order to prove God, Jesus' power, or his blindness was someone else's fault, or even using the, he's blind, but there are other people who can see, but they're worse because they're spiritually blind. But I want to stretch a bit, as the pastor I mentioned talked about, and I'll share his sermon when I send out the the video. In some ways, I think this is not so much about blindness as something wrong that needs to be fixed or spiritual blindness, but it's about becoming aware of the ways that we exclude or ignore or dehumanize people based on, on something that they can't control. It's not comfortable, it's not pleasant to talk about these things, but there are many people who have often been excluded. And those people who've been excluded have been hurt because of their race. In the city, in this region, people are still reeling after the shooting in Buffalo last May when a young man came from Buffalo, with, or came from Binghamton to Buffalo with the intent to kill people because they were black. Or people who've been excluded by their gender. Well, you know, men can't be nurses. Women can't be pastors. And yet they can. Two weeks ago, there was a speaker that came to University of Buffalo who publicly stated and talked about at his speech about wanting to eliminate transgender people from society. I know that's something that makes people uncomfortable sometimes to talk about these things they don't understand. But I can tell you that after getting to know some of my colleagues and some of my students who are transgender, they experience a lot of disrespect and mistreatment over just wanting to be their true selves. Some people even make a point of using the wrong names or the wrong pronouns. But not calling someone what they ask to be called is disrespect. I had a friend in church growing up. His father was David, so he was David Jr. And so when he was little, everybody called him Davy. Well, he got to a point he really didn't want to be called that anymore. And of course, I will admit that some of the kids, myself included, knowing that that bothered him, intentionally, hey, Davey, how you doing? Some people may think it's a joke or they may think it's something minor. But that kind of disrespect, that kind of intentional harm has serious consequences. Studies have shown that transgender people and other LGBT people have very high rates of self-harm and suicide. We may not understand it. It may make us uncomfortable to talk about these things, but they're still God's children. And if Jesus is calling us to love one another, shouldn't we be loving everyone, not just the people we like? Lent is a time of reflection, pausing, praying, 
of getting away from distractions so that we can pay attention to God. Maybe it'll give us a chance to notice those around us that we've been ignoring, to become aware of the things we've been doing, maybe unintentionally, that harm others. A chance to stop judging on appearances, as in the story of King David, and to remember that God provides for us and that God provides us ways that we can all serve. Amen. Let us close with amazing grace.
Kindred, set out from this place not to anoint power, prestige, and the outer appearances of grandiosity. Rather set out from this place to anoint healing, renewal, and raise up those unexpected places and people that God has set apart for the transformation of the world. Open yourselves to the surprising and unexpected movements of the Holy Spirit, for around the corner of every assumption we carry and every community we live in is a small shepherd among us waiting to lead with God's help. Go forth in peace to lead, to love, and be renewed by God. Amen. And all God's people said, Have a good week, everyone, and hope to see many of you on Friday. <laughs>